Captain Schilling confessed his crimes in 1995, where the impunity laws were applicable in Argentina. He confessed his crimes, and uh, he could not be prosecuted by anyone in my country. He decided to come to uh, Eclair, uh, to give his position in Spain because he said that he had uh, been told that he could have been become a, a protected witness. And actually, I mentioned that to him. I said, you cannot be a protected witness because you are an actor. You committed a crime. So you were not witnessing them. And actually, at the end of the deposition, Baltasar Garzon uh, ordered his detention, his arrest. And it was not only because in Argentina there was no possible prosecution in Spain, and because it was, uh, well, uh, instead of, of versus what happened in Spain, he was sentenced to 140 years in prison. So this is a complex judicial process. Well, in the beginning it was 140 years, and if there were like a superior instance for appeal, he could be sentenced to 12, uh, 2,500 years. Well, in Argentina, the maximum sentence is 25 years because it is false. It is false what Gallardot said. So not only that universal jurisdiction is good and valid, but because it was essential. It was essential for us to finish with impunity in Argentina, to put an end to impunity. But it was not the one and only factor. There were many other factors. And actually, this was possible because in Argentina, there is one movement to advocate for human rights Well, that has been made up by relatives of victims of the dictatorship, and the universal symbols that are well known are the mothers of, from the May Square. They are represented here by Estela Carlota. She is the president of these mothers. And that movement created the connection, as Ripruti said before, created the political conditions for that to become possible. And actually, it created those conditions so that, first of all, to have back in 1985 a first trial where the former rulers of the military junta were convicted. Second, it also allowed that, in addition to the impunity laws, uh, the law for the demand of justice could move forward. And uh, so that it resulted in a number of proceedings, uh, processes across the world. Well, the movement in Spain started by Carlos Castrezana, accepted by Baltasar Garzón, was the most important, but it was not the only one. Uh, these military men were also condemned in Italy as well as in France. And actually, they were also convicted uh, in, by the US country. Well, there was one process that did not finish in Germany, or that was not successful in Germany. And then, well, in Argentina, we had the processes for the truth, where the possibility to prosecution was terminated, the funder for the social and legal studies, Emilio Mignoni, that I uh, replaced after his death, he said that even if a law forbidden or did not allow the penal prosecution, the state, it was mandatory for the state to inform the relatives about what happened with the, the victim, the person that was disappeared, was murdered, etc. And these processes that became what, gradually widespread across the country, in addition to the processes of suppression of the identity of the disappeared victims, which was a crime that was excluded, that were accepted from the laws of impunity. That one as well as the theft of the goods of the victims were excluded. But it's still so, despite these impunity laws, the um, case or the aspects or this element continue to be alive. 
with the support of the social movements and human rights advocates. So when Captain Shilingo confessed the crimes that he had committed when he was arrested by Garson, when the Criminal National Court sentenced him, the repercussion that that had in Argentina, together with the other elements that I mentioned before, resulted that in the year 2000, when we were about to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the military coup, we decided to ask to the justice to annul this uh, law, because we, at the time, we had all the legal, national, international, social conditions in order to bring down those laws on impunity. So we understood that because we were in the uh, close to the 25th anniversary of the military coup, we could envision or we could anticipate strong social movement and that would also allow or would trigger uh, decision made according to law. And this is an element that has that has must be always taken into account, whether we are talking about in the universal jurisdiction, international law, if there are no social and political conditions in place, if there is not an organized so society claiming for that will not happen. If those c conditions are met, exist, there is a high likeliness for those changes to take place and for those decisions to be made. And actually, we are deeply thankful to Baltasar Garzón. We understand that universal jurisdiction that has such a, played such a great role for Argentina. We wish that it could play such a big role also in other countries in the world. We have also taken part in the complaint lodged uh, for the, well, what happened in the dictatorship here in Spain. So we've been taking the positions in several places in Spain. We have supporting, we have supporting that case. So it is a return, it's something that we want to give Spain in return as a token for our um, appreciation for what they did for us. I remember back in 1999 when Shilingo was sentenced, as far as I can remember, uh, at that time, Asnar was in power, President Asnar was in power. There was a strong pressure against uh, Baltasar Garzón. There was an attempt was being made to disqualify or to discredit the role that he was taking, the activities that he was carrying out. At that time, it was being said that was that, that was being a barrier, that that was hindering the relationships between Spain and Latin America. And to be honest, it must be said that the relationships of the Latin American peoples with Spain, you know, were never were, um, uh, were so good, continued to be as good as when at the time of Columbus. You know, this was the title. This was the title of an article that we had. Well, the relationships between the two countries or the two areas were never, never, ever before, not in 500 years of history. Well, of course, there were a number of international, significant international conditions in place in the year 1998 when Baltasar Garzón ordered the arrest of uh, Pinochet in London. He said that, uh, he admitted that he was surprised when that happened. So but well, the uh, anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was two months ahead only. And well, something that was not mentioned here, which I believe it was, it is extremely important, is that at that time, the Balkans genocide was um, folding. So we could see on TV, live, in colors, what was happening two hours away from here where we could see human skeletons before uh, barbed wire, where we could see colored images of the Shoah, and then where that was uh, 
was very, very strong for the universal awareness. So I can remember myself uh, being present in one of the hearings in a, a trial for extradition in, in London. And there, the defendant of Pinochet, she made a reference to the principle of sovereign immunity. And at that time, she gave the worst example she could have thought of. She says, if Hitler had survived the Second World War, and if he had wanted to come over here to have tea, no one could have uh, have done any could have done anything against him. And I thought that it was uh, that I couldn't hear well, that it was uh, that I misheard it. And actually, I asked the person next to me, and I said, did I understand well? And he said, yes, you understood well. And I said, well, well, you have a defendant like that. You don't need any prosecutor whatsoever, any public prosecutor. It was just intolerable, unthinkable to hear that from uh, him. Extradition was um, uh, given, and then ratifying the importance the, of political factors, Then there were, well, discussions between the socialist government in Chile, the Labour government in Labour Party in the UK, so that, well, they, because they wanted Pinochet to be sent to Chile to be prosecuted there. But at the time, well, based on a commitment that the Chileans have entered into, because Pinochet started to talk about the dimension and, well, couldn't walk. But then the miracle happened when he went off the plane, then he uh, threw away his cane, he threw away his wheelchair. And then, of course, we could see he proved that he was fit to stand trial. And then when the trial started, then the uh, accused uh, died. Well, these are the lessons learned uh, from the viewpoint of an Argentinian person that I wanted to share with you. Well, universal justice has come to stay, provided that it is taken on, it is embraced by stakeholders and by relevant actors in the society. Neither the justice, neither or or the, nor the law have a s autonomous life. They are just a reflection of the social awareness and of uh, political. Fights or struggles. So it is a high a valuable valuable instrument, but it is at the hands in the hands of the society. So it is in the hands of the society that universal jurisdiction is uh, properly executed and uh, suitably executed. So I finish my uh, intervention as uh, a speaker of this panel, and now I take off my scarf, and now I would I, we wear the hats of the uh, chairperson of this round table. And as a chairperson, I have the pleasure to introduce Juan Garcés. He's a lawyer, he's got a degree in law by the University Complutense in Madrid, and he's got a PhD in political sciences by the Sorbonne University. So Juan is much more than the degrees or titles that he holds. There are many other people with these qualifications, but regarding his history, his personal history, he is unique. He was the personal political advisor of Salvador Allende, the director general of UNESCO in 1974, and the member of the personal team of François Mitterrand in the run-up to the uh, uh, presidency of the French Republic as a candidate from the Programa Común de las Izquierdas from the left party. So, according, well, hopefully, Carlos Lepoy will be here as well as Manuel Oyesese. Well, they have been uh, leaders of this process. Joan Garces also played his, his, exactly the same role in, but in Chile. In soon after the Argentina lodged, the Chilean uh, claim was lodged. 
And then that claim helped us in Argentina because when Baltasar issued hundreds arrest uh, warrants, well, the Chileans already knew that Baltasar Garzón was serious. And uh, well, they said, well, this is uh, propaganda, it is of no use, nothing will happen. And then they started to understand. And then at that time, they started to prefer to be prosecuted in Argentina rather than being sent to Spain for prosecution. Because, well, they could see that over there they still had new people in high places that could minimize, you know, the uh, convictions or could help them out in that process. Well, Joan Garces is a fundamental person of our times. He is one of the relevant uh, figures and uh, remarkable people that have acted and carried out activities and worked on both sides of the Atlantic in recent years. It is a privilege to